And Station, this is Houston on Space to Ground 2. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is Station. I am ready for the event. Big Ten Network, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Tom Sandak. How do you hear me? Hello, Tom. This is Drew Foisel on the space station. I've got you loud and clear. Great. Uh, well, Commander, thank you so much for joining me. Um, for, our, for our viewers on the Big Ten Network, would you mind just uh, introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about the status of the, uh, the current mission here? Well, you're joining me on uh, during Expedition 56, and right now we have six crew members on board. We have three Americans, one German, and two Russians. We've been on orbit together for a few months now, and in uh, at the end of uh, or beginning of October, myself, uh, Ricky Arnold, and Oleg Artemyev will be returning back to Earth, and our three other crewmates, uh, Alex Gers, will take over as commander. Serena Anand Chancellor will stay on as the American crew member, and Sergei Prokopiev, the Russian, will remain as well, and they'll start Expedition 57. Um, on, you know, on this current mission, is there anything that's been most surprising, any exciting things you've learned so far? Well, I can tell you that every day on the space station is very exciting for us. Uh, we're always working on different experiments. We have each day uh, several uh, several experiments that we're working on, and on during the course of the mission, we'll work on between 100 and 150 different experiments. Uh, we're working on everything from uh, uh, medical, uh, things with medical applications, uh, material science, uh, uh, learning about uh, humans living and working in space. And uh, we perform spacewalks or work outside of the space station where we make repairs. And in general, uh, a lot of our work involves keeping the space station operating, so we do a lot of maintenance work as well just to make sure that the experiments that are here that have been designed by researchers on Earth uh, continue to operate and function normally. And you can think of us as the hands and the eyes and the ears of the researchers who send their experiments to space, and our job is to understand what the objectives are and carry out the research for them and make sure that they're able to collect the data in the way that they desire to learn about working the experiments in a zero gravity or, or a microgravity environment that we have on the International Space Station. Shifting gears a little bit, I know our audience would appreciate um, hearing a little bit about where you went to college, where you graduated from, as well as uh, what went into that decision. Well, I think you're probably, since you're a Big Ten Network, you're probably referring to Purdue University, but in fact, I've attended uh, three universities or three schools. I started off at Community College in Michigan, at Oakland Community College, and that allowed me to transfer over to Purdue University, where I remained for uh, three years to complete a bachelor's degree in solid earth sciences and another two years to receive a master's degree in geophysics. And following that time at Purdue, I transferred up to Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, where I, where I received my Ph.D. in seismology. But the time spent at Purdue was very important to me. In fact, uh, Purdue University has been in my family for a long time. I had an uncle who graduated back in 1905 in civil engineering, and my father and uh, uncle both attended Purdue University in the early and mid-60s. And so it seemed like a natural progression for me to actually uh, attend the university myself. It was, it was the only school that I applied to after community college and uh, was a great decision for me. In fact, I met my wife there and uh, we are still together today after 28 years of marriage. And uh, we have two children, two beautiful children that also considered Purdue but uh, haven't made it there yet. But it's been in the family for a long time and Purdue University is very holds a very special place in our heart. Incredible. Um, you know, I, I know many know, uh, some others might not, that Purdue has such a strong history of space travel, um, the, the cradle of astronauts, if you will. Um, what does it mean to be a part of such a storied tradition to you? 
Well, what's great about, well, let me start off by saying before I joined NASA, I was actually working at uh, Exxon Mobil Corporation in Houston. And I can tell you there were a significant number of Purdue graduates there as well. So Purdue is known for its uh, space and space exploration and contributions there, but also for engineering and sciences around the world. So they were well represented at uh, Exxon. And I wasn't surprised when I got down to NASA to find that there was a significant number of Purdue graduates, not only as astronauts, but that work in our flight control center and work across the uh, across the center, not only at Johnson Space Center, but around the country. So Purdue's got a great reputation for being involved in science and engineering and uh, NASA is no exception to that representation and I'm proud when I when I talk about the university and I'm proud to be one of the astronauts that uh, that represent the school and we've just recently uh, brought on a, a, another one so I think we're up to 23 or 24 astronauts now that uh, have Purdue heritage and uh, it's great to work with those individuals and share stories about being at the school uh, and look forward to future contributions of, uh, of Purdue uh, within the space program and space exploration. Um, and congratulations, of course, on the, the recent honor um, of the honorary degree that you received um, while aboard the International Space Station. Can you talk to me a little bit about uh, what that meant to you, but also kind of the, uh, I imagine it's a pretty unique uh, way that they did that? Uh, I don't know, you know if, uh, if you're aware of any other degrees being conferred in such a manner. Well, it was unique, and I later found out that there was, I believe, two other uh, honorary doctorates that were conferred in space, but I'm not sure if they were live during a commencement ceremony or how they actually carried out that work. But what was really special is that uh, my crewmate, Scott Tingle, who was here with me during Expedition 55, and also a Purdue graduate on his first space flight, uh, Scott's the one that actually hooded me during the ceremony. So it was really special for us. In fact, I can tell you that um, of all the events that I've done, of all the outreach events, of all the interviews I've done, that that event was probably the most significant for me. Uh, it was the most almost overwhelming. My heart was beating quite strong and I, my, I was sort of taking my breath away as I was uh, as I was accepting the degree and, and even preparing for that and getting ready for the event. So it was very special. I was glad to have another Purdue graduate here to participate and uh, hood me. And I appreciate what uh, President Daniels did at the university to uh, make that all happen and allow us not only to, for not only for me to receive the degree, but also to try to share that moment with the graduating class that was there and try to impress upon them the importance of what they had just achieved and what their future may hold for them. Uh, the school uh, has a long history, as we've just talked about, in space exploration, but really the, the idea was that uh, by, being, by representing the school and receiving the degree, maybe to inspire those individuals who are graduating to continue in their, in their paths and go on to do great things and set their goals high, and, and who knows where, where the end of that path will lead. You know, you've, you've talked a, a bit, understandably, about outreach and, um, you know, making sure the, the mission is extending around the world to as many people. Um, in prepare for this, I, I followed you on Instagram and have really enjoyed it. Um, I'm curious why that's something that you, you do seem to enjoy it as well on your end and why you prioritize that as uh, something with all the many things that I'm sure are on your plate every day. I think the key for me, Tom, is that I want people to believe that their possibilities are limitless. I didn't do well in high school. I started at community college and worked as a mechanic. Those things all shaped me, shaped my life, helped me realize what I could do, what my potential might be. And I like sharing the story because I don't, it's not that, un, it's not an uncommon story, but it maybe it's unique in that I didn't just go straight into school and do all the things that might allow me to have become an astronaut. I followed, I pursued the things that I liked. I enjoyed geology and geosciences. I felt I was good at it, and by being good at it, I became recognized in the field. And I think that made me a good candidate for becoming an astronaut, along with the skills that I obtained while I was at community college working as a mechanic. My mechanical skills have benefited benefited me significantly, not only with the work that we do inside the space station, but also outside the space station. So I like to share the story hoping that 
individuals will never second guess their ability to reach their goals and dreams. And I think having uh, thoughts in their minds, subconscious programming that that they just have a desire to do something or reach some goal, nothing's out of reach and anything is possible. And really what it takes is determination. It does require a few doors to be open for you and, and, and in some fortuitous moments. And I think that's something else for successful people to remember is that it's worth it to give somebody a chance and allow individuals to pursue opportunities uh, even if they don't have the track record you're looking for or, or you're looking for a, a very particular individual. If someone comes to you with a desire to do something and maybe they're an underdog, it's always worth it to give them a chance because you never know what they're capable of. And if that person is determined and focused on their goals, uh, they'll do a great job because they'll like their work. And when you like your work, you do good at it. When you do, do good at it, you're successful. So I, mean, I think that's the key. There's a lot of lessons there. So I like to try to reach out and share what my opinion and thoughts are on creating opportunities for other individuals, but also for individuals themselves to not lose sight of their goals and dreams. Oh, well said. Uh, you know, the, the ideas behind STEM and STEM education, I'm sure, resonate. I know they do with, with you and the rest of the crew. Um, I'm curious, though, you know, there's also been a, a recent push in the last few years to add the A. Uh, to STEM and make it STEAM representing the arts. Um, as a scientist, as an astronaut who also takes some really incredible pictures, um, you have a lot of other interests, I know. Um, I'm wondering how you see the arts and science overlapping and that the arts being an important part of that equation as well for educating future astronauts, but, you know, kids of all, uh, of all stripes. Yeah, it's a great question. I think the key there is that we as people need to educate ourselves and have a well-rounded education. Um, I'm a musician. I play guitar. When I was at community college, I also studied um, industrial design drawing. So I had a, an idea that maybe I would be an automotive designer. So that was an art, artistic uh, side to my education or arts and liberal sciences. And that is important. And I think the key isn't the key isn't just STEM, and I, and I think we'll see in the future with astronauts as humans begin to explore space further and live in space, that arts will become just as important as science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Those, those are key components of what we do right now contributing to space exploration. But the human race isn't just made up of science, scientists, technologists, uh, engineers, and mathematicians. It's made of humans, and humans have all different backgrounds. And What's important for us here as crew that work in space that, that to bring the humanity to what we do is that we have the background in arts as well, arts and humanities. Those things make, I think, all of us better, better humans. And so it's important. I think adding the A is great. Um, there's no doubt that right now astronauts, uh, the selection of astronauts is focused on science, technology, and engineering, but there is a component that we evaluate when we're selecting astronauts or considering folks is what else do they bring to the table? What's that other component that sets them apart from a pure scientist or a pure engineer? And a lot of times that's art. And uh, so it, it is important. I agree wholeheartedly with it. I don't know why we would exclude anybody with uh, or, or any individuals that are pursuing those career paths as well. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit just about your uh, big picture perspective up there. Um, is there is there some aspect of the perspective you have um, that's hard to capture, both visually and when you try to put it into words for for people either like myself who may interview you or when you return? Um, what's what's the part that's kind of hard to really help people grasp? I think the challenge for me personally. Even within myself is trying to understand how it is as humans we don't get the bigger picture of, and I, I think we've coined the phrase, uh, the overview effect of astronauts, where we come to space and we look down on the planet and it's nearly impossible to see borders, um, sep not, not only separating states, obviously, but countries and uh, regions of the world. And it's difficult to comprehend all of the challenges that we have uh, working together 
with what I think should be the common goal of preserving life. And uh, I think meaning to life is more than simply, um, you know, making a lot of money and, and um, just looking at the bottom line. I think for all of us as humans, what we re need to realize is what we have is Earth, and this is our home. And when we look out in space, we don't see anything else. I mean, we see stars, but they're a long ways away, and it's not like we're zipping around from planet to planet uh, building other homesteads for us as humans. We're not doing that. We don't have that capability. We look down on the Earth, the beautiful planet, and, and look, and, and we, I think we see how fragile it is, and that uh, is difficult for astronauts to convey. We try with photos, we try when we speak to individuals, but there aren't that many of us to convey the stories. And I think as time goes on and humans get better about reaching out into space and uh, with us all realizing that humans and space exploration has been only been going on for about 50 years, we're really just at the beginning of our capability. And I think with time, our world, even every day, every month, every year that technology gets better. I think that's what's connecting us, but the reality is the world's sort of getting smaller. Our world community is getting smaller. It's so much easier for us to reach out across the, the world to somebody else and other other cultures and, and learn about them. I think eventually we'll get there, uh, but I think that's the big challenge for astronauts right now is trying to impress upon people who have not seen Earth from space that it looks fragile in it and it you really just want to cradle the planet and do what you can to uh, make sure that we're just being good stewards. I mean there's no doubt that humans need to live and to live we need energy and so right now we only have certain technologies that allow us to get energy. For example, um, natural resources, we need to consume them to make things that'll, that basically to keep us alive. And so uh, we are consumers of our earth. The point is that we need to be responsible in the way that we use the earth to sustain our life. And also we need to build the capability to move out from the earth uh, to look for other resources so that we can continue. And I think that's, that's sort of the bottom line is, is recognizing who we are as a species uh, and that we need to use the earth, but we, we need to use it responsibly and we need to, I think, treat each other better uh, so that we're all working for the common goal. Well, I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of lessons in there for us to take with us um, from your perspective. Um, do you have any, any final messages, particularly for uh, maybe our younger viewers or uh, the Purdue faithful who might be watching as well? Um, what, would you, what would you leave them with? Well, for the, for the Purdue uh, folks out there, I would just say boiler up and uh, enjoy the start of another school year. Uh, I know I always looked, uh, I didn't look so much forward to the start of the school year, but I certainly looked forward to the end of the year, uh, the end of the school year in the spring when uh, the trees started to get green and the grass started to come out and, uh, and Grand Prix started to roll around. That was always my favorite time of the year at Purdue was uh, the Purdue Grand Prix. So good luck to all you Purdue uh, students out there. Uh, the, the time is well spent and it will be worth every effort that you put into it. And for the rest of the young viewers, keep up the good work. Uh, the sky is not the limit and uh, don't ever lose sight of your goals. Well said. Uh, Commander, I just want to really uh, thank you for your perspective, um, your contribution to you know, our, our country and, and the world, uh, really, and the opportunity that you've uh, given us here to, to speak with you today. And uh, we all wish you safe travels. Thanks very much, Tom. Take care. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. And thank you to the Big Ten Network. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.